Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ivan IV, more commonly known as Ivan the Terrible. He was the son of Vasily III, who is the Rurikid ruler of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. After his father's death, however, at just three years old, Ivan was named the Grand Prince, and by the time he was 16, he was declared as the Tsar or Emperor of Russia, officially establishing the Tsardom of Russia. Ivan and his reign are certainly known for the transformation of Russia from a medieval state to an empire, but not without a huge cost to the people of Russia, as well as a hit to the long-term economy. Ivan has been described as being intelligent and devout, but also prone to paranoia, rage, and episodic outbreaks of mental instability that only increased the older he got. One of the main points of extreme violence and viciousness was the massacre of Novgorod, which saw the deaths of an estimated 2,000 to 15,000 people, as well as a shocking amount of acts of extreme, violent cruelty. In the later years, like I mentioned, his violent tendencies only got worse, which led to him doing things like striking his heir in the heat of an argument so badly that it left him with brain damage. In the end, Ivan the Terrible met his demise from a heart attack in 1584. Yeah, they say that impaling hundreds of people every day isn't great for the heart health. Someone should should have let him know about vitamins and minerals, or maybe some good cardio heavy exercise. I don't know. In our number 9 spot today, we have Leopold II. As the second king of the Belgians, Leopold has been said to be responsible for the deaths of somewhere between 2 to 15 million people. Yeah, million. It wasn't in Belgium that he committed his atrocious acts, however. It all started when he claimed himself to be the founder and sole owner of the Congo Free State, which was a private project he undertook on his own. Leopold loved colonialism. He wanted to colonize everything he possibly could, and this is why he started the International African Society, which he used to travel to Africa, claim land that obviously wasn't his, and we're not talking about a small piece. We're talking about land that is several times the size of Belgium, and many countries just let him do this and allowed him to freely rule this land. This is definitely already bad enough, but of course things only got worse. Leopold had his own private militia that he used to force the indigenous population into hard labor. While Leopold was doing this, of course, for economic reasons, he also was just doing this because he was a messed up guy. He was terrible. He made those who lived here harvest and process rubber, and the punishments for those who didn't harvest enough for him were extremely severe. Not to mention, it is also said that sometimes he would just inflict harm because he could. Eventually, a stop needed to be put to his wrongdoings, but of course he was going to do everything he could to hide some of the horrors he did. The entire archive of the Congo Free State was burned, and he told his aide that even though the Congo had been taken from him, quote, they have no right to know what I did there. The Congo was taken from him, but remained under the rule of Belgium in 1908 until the Congo was given independence in 1960. As for Leopold, well, he remained the ruler of Belgium until his death in 1909, but the secret was out now, and no one liked him. In fact, his funeral procession was booed by the crowd because everyone was angry at him for the things that he had done. In our number 8 spot today, we have Qin Shi Huang. While this leader is often credited with creating the first unified Chinese empire, the Qin Dynasty, these accomplishments didn't come cheap. When he came to power in 221 BCE, he strictly followed seven principles, which not only pushed for severe punishment, but also acted in contraries and issued unattainable orders. He also is said to have been extremely paranoid about the power of the educated, which led to him burning books so that no one could ever learn what was in them, and he also killed 460 Confucian scholars in just one year, which some claim was because they were unable to make him immortal? Huang wanted not only to establish a transport system, but also build a wall to keep out enemies, and this meant that he had to relocate at least 120,000 families. He declared that all would be equal under one law, and then taxed everyone heavily. And because of these heavy taxes, as well as the insane labor that was expected to create the wall and the transport system, thousands of people were overworked, starved, and perished. He also had laborers create a massive tomb for him, complete with 8,000 life-size terracotta warriors and horses, which you may be familiar with, because now it is rumored to be an extremely haunted place. I mean, an evil ruler's resting place? Yeah, of 
course it's haunted. In our number 7 spot today we have Don Carlos. I'll be honest, this little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kind of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias during the mid 1500s as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth which many believe could be due to the inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviours though are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things like hurting or taking the lives of animals just for fun. I mean nowadays we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then they just chalked it up to boys being boys. It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Red flags, they were abundant. Soon of course his cruelties would extend to humans with people claiming that one time he chose to whip a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made the prince that he didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided there's no way in hell. Like he was so bad, she would rather marry his dad, which she did in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement, where he passed away six months later. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles the Sixth. King Charles the Sixth started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him happy packing up knights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was totally abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances bricked up. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number 5 spot today, we have Nero. For this one, we are going to be taking it all the way back to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful times. Times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, he burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal all of these were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality as well as his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 4 spot today, we have Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the leader of the Cambodian revolutionary group called the Khmer Rogue, and this group with him at the forefront went on to try and destroy the Cambodian civilization. This wasn't necessarily how the group started out, but once Paul and others who shared his ideals came to lead it, things quickly became very dark. He is likely one of the only people who ordered a mass genocide in his own country. The reasoning behind all of this is because he believed that destroying the civilization was the best way to start a new regime and bring in a new age. He ended up serving as the Prime Minister from 1976 until 1979, during which his policies led to the deaths of around 2 million people, which is horrifying. That was about 25% of the entire population. He even liked to keep the skulls of those he had killed. Just gonna say, it seems as though politics was the mask for someone who just really wanted to kill people. There are so many horrific details surrounding him and the things he did, much of which I can't even repeat here on YouTube, and that is exactly how he landed a spot here on today's list. He truly did some horrendous things, and in the end, went on to live the rest of his life and died of natural causes before he could even answer for any of his crimes, which is just the most frustrating end to a horrible tale. In our number 3 spot today, we have Maximilian Robespierre. Pierre. Okay, I'll be honest. 
This is quite a polarizing one. Maximilian, on one hand, was great. He advocated for universal suffrage, for unrestricted admission to national posts, and he was against racial and religious discrimination. Especially in the time he ruled in, this was huge. Of course people were against him, but in our modern views, he was way ahead of his time in these beliefs. On the other hand, however, he was extremely violent and was the leader during most of the French reign of terror that happened during the revolution. It is said that during this time he was responsible for imprisoning somewhere around 300,000 and killing somewhere around 40,000. During the revolution in 1793, he was elected head of the Committee of Public Safety and from that point on, any voice that was in opposition to the change that was happening was struck down and silenced by him. Throughout the years, his ego and power only grew, which led to him being a little too quick to use the guillotine, his favorite execution method. He was getting a little too cozy with that thing, so much so that he began to use it even on people who had, at one time, been his allies. We saw this clearly when it came to the execution of George Danton, who Maximilian had executed after he suggested maybe chilling out on the whole reign of terror thing. In the end, people caught on to this tendency for violence and horrible punishments, which definitely lost some of his public support, and this was only exacerbated when it was realized that he now had beliefs that directly contradicted those he had earlier, like when he tried to create a national religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being. By the time 1794 came around, he was overthrown, and later that year he found himself being executed by you guessed it, the guillotine. Not good, no thanks. In our number two spot today, we have Vlad Tepes. Often referred to as Vlad the Impaler, he was the ruler of Wallachia three times between 1448 until his death in 1476. He is often regarded as one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history, and to many he is a hero, and this is not to disregard that. But you don't get a nickname like the Impaler by being a passive, peaceful guy. Vlad was known for his brutality and his love of impaling people, but it is also said that everyone's favorite vampire, Dracula, was modeled after him. This is because it is rumored that Vlad liked to dip his bread in the blood of his enemies before eating it. I prefer a little olive oil and balsamic vinegar with mine, but hey, to each his own, I guess. Vlad is known for his intimidation tactics, which included having bodies of those he had killed lined up outside of the city so that any enemies approaching would know what fate they had coming. Like I mentioned before, many regard Vlad as a hero. I mean, it is abundantly clear that he fought as hard as he could to protect Romania and Bulgaria from the Ottomans, but that doesn't mean that the horrific things he did have been forgotten either. Vlad definitely left quite the legacy behind when he was killed in 1476. In our number one spot today, we have Joseph Stalin. Stalin was a Georgian revolutionary and Soviet political leader who governed the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. Despite the fact that he started his time governing the country as a part of a collective leader, by the 1930s, he had consolidated all of the power and went on to begin acting as the Soviet Union's dictator. During his reign, Stalin was responsible for the deaths of over 60 million people, 20 million of them being his own. Apparently, the math works out to about 40,000 people per week, which is just unbelievable. For almost 30 years, he reigned the Soviet Union with terror and violence. I mean, his decisions led to a famine that killed millions of people. Also, the lives he took weren't just of his enemies. I mean, how could one person have 60 million enemies? He would take the lives of families of people he liked. He just took too many lives, was too paranoid, and while he was powerful and smart, he could also be an absolute monster. This is all perfectly summed up when he said, quote, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings, back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage, and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, 
He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning Coffee This is the worst of the worst people. Murad the Fourth, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not going to know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older he put forth these laws, punishable by death might I add. In order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number 7. Party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming dynasty in the early 1500s. Now lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready, they're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, kings like that actually existed, they were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing, he transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean on one hand I'm glad the animals are free, but like a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number 6, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you going to do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like dude, not the time. Number 5. George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean I used to collect special quarters growing up. 
I swear to God. The only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word. Philately. Philately. Back in 1905 he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it, yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kind of just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too. Check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now, born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also, so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye-opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem, we love him. We are At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time, while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, 
use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch, love it, or list it for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day. And if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally like fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built. So he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery. Just standing there, just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrenstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. Jen, what a drag. Bachelor number one. What would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William the First, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman king of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number nine, let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason, the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry and you're living fat with high society, you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number eight. Cashback. King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money, which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still gonna boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, he sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I hate to loan this guy a nickel. Number seven, Terrible Ivan. He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell him about the other world monuments? Number six. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. 
Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons. Another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number 5. Nothing Left Alexander the Great was an excellent warrior for his time. Having conquered so much at a young age is really quite impressive. His empire stretched from Greece all the way to India. For a history class or a good book, this is fine, but in reality, he was a conqueror. The places he was marching into weren't exactly happy to have spear-wielding visitors. He laid siege on multiple cities, executed those who defied him, and sold people into YouTube's least favorite S-word. Just about checks off everything a guy needs to be considered a tyrant. History remembers his conquest, but I for sure will not forget how brutal conquerors can really be. Number 4 Chop Chop While Maximilian Robespierre was not a king in the monarch sense, he did hold a lot of political power in France when the political climate was quite messy. Plus, France was at war. But even messier than that is the way he dealt with citizens who were deemed anti-revolution by sending them to the guillotine. Within a one year period, he sent 17,000 people to their dooms via the National Razor, or as it became to be known. He even began practicing deism, something he called the cult of the supreme being. And if you know your history, you know that you can't get away with that forever. And with some sweet poetic justice, Rosepierre was sentenced to the guillotine. Number 3 All My Friends Are Dead Usually when people expire, the human thing to do is bury said lifeless human. It's just what we do. But apparently Ferdinand I of Naples did not get that memo, instead taking a page from Night of the Museum. No, this is not a cute comedy movie starring Ben Stiller, but in reality a complete horrifying nightmare. Ferdinand took the saying, keep your enemies close, a little too literally, as his favorite form of punishment was to mummify his enemies. Which let's face it, if he's a king, there's gonna be plenty. And he would like to display these mummies in what's probably the coolest place to be if you're into that weird goth stuff. He did keep some alive in the dungeon, but he much preferred his guests embalmed, where he would have them dressed up on display, just as they were before making the mistake of crossing Ferdinand. Now, what's the point of having that hardcore collection if you're not going to show it off? Well, he did. To the people he suspected of treason, which in a place like that, treason leaves your mind pretty quick. Number 2 Average Height for the Time Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists of his time, maybe of all time. With full support of the French army, Napoleon found himself earning gallant victories one after another, all being accomplished at a very young age. However, after years of grand success in multiple wars and kicking a lot of imperial butt, it started to go to his head. Shortly after the coup that overthrew Robespierre, Napoleon had gained enough support to claim himself as the Emperor of France. With said power, dissolved the freedom of press, reduced the rights of women, and oh yeah, he was at war with most of Europe for years to come. While his military victories cannot be understated, his rise as a tyrannical dictator makes him very unholy. Number 1 Dracula There's been a lot of unholy things said here today, but old Vladdy takes the cake. What he lacked in land and power, he made up for in his brutality. As the legends go, Vlad was creative in his punishments, and was well noted for his human art pieces. And by art, I mean impaling his enemy on pikes, sometimes to their rear ends, and leaving them as warnings for anyone who dared cross him. Similar to the time, visiting envoys wouldn't remove their hats as it is to do in tradition, so Vlad had their hats nailed to their skulls, so that they may never remove them. There are a few other stories that are just too hot for YouTube, but I think he's a textbook example of unholy. He may also be the inspiration for Dracula. Imagine being that much of a monster one is created in your likeness. I mean, just looking at the painting of this guy creeps me out, man. Whoa! At number 10, Royal Enemas. Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas. 
in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no. My guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress and gave the duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. At number 9, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it, to be honest. When I tell you this horse, was treated better than most people have ever been, I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, so he was assassinated. Now before I carry on telling you guys about the wild and crazy things that kings did back in the day, I would like to first ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe think about subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mummia Medicine. It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, and one of those methods included in the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy. And this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human fat was later used to treat treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number 7, Kissing Sheets For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. At number 6, Eternal Youth I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years, and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea, and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with 
finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. At number 5, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number 4, Prankster King You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. This guy was really quite immature. At number 3, Saints in Bed I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number 2, Rat Court Martial There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm I'm not funny. I'll leave. Number 10, King Midas. Most people know the story of King Midas, but in a nutshell, he was a king who was granted the power of the everything he touched turned to solid gold. So 
No, he didn't exactly buy anything with that kind of power, but the man can have anything he wants or buy anything he wants. It's a lot of gold. This sounds great, but it's really awful for a couple of reasons. One, that is pretty much the moral of the story, and the other is, well, some basic uh, economy stuff. The first reason this would suck is that one, you should never be too greedy, and you really shouldn't. And you should always be careful what you wish for. This blessing quickly turned into a curse as Midas could no longer eat. Which, that's bad. Not eating and everything touch turn of gold. Oh, you couldn't hug anybody. It's terrible. The other issue would be his wealth. You'd have to be very careful on how many items you actually touched, as producing too much gold would eventually devalue the price of gold. Especially if you touch a bed or something, that, that's, that's a lot of gold. Imagine how much a solid gold bed would weigh, or how much that would be worth. So in reality, you would be both starving and poor. Number 9, Mansa Musa. Sort of related to the King Midas issue, Mansa Musa was probably the richest man to ever walk the face of the earth. A king from northern Africa who exploited his country's salt and gold reserves. His estimated wealth today would be around the $400 billion mark. $400 billion US. Ooh, that's a lot of money. Tough to actually measure it exactly because it was from so long ago, but it could be less, and some say it could actually even be more. Mansa Musa went on tour one year to see all the beautiful things he could of the ancient world, and you can't take a little vacation without buying something at the gift shop. Mansa Musa was so rich and spent so much money in a few towns that he visited that he single handedly upset the economy of those cities. Elon Musk wishes he could. So he basically bought a lot of stuff, and it was unusual because it upset the economy. Like, he destroyed the economy of those downs. That's insane. Number eight, Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Ah, see, I got you. I pulled a sneaky on you. But yeah, he's still a king. And maybe he was the biggest celebrity who ever lived. Would Halloween really be Halloween without Thriller? And how could cool guys let you know they were cool in the 80s if they didn't have all that leather jacket and stuff? You wouldn't be able to know. You just wouldn't. Well, maybe some things you don't know about Michael Jackson were his shopping habits. The man loved shopping. And with that kind of money, well, you can do anything. Well, some may remember his chimp, his Neverland Mansion, complete with carnival rides and arcade, and even an oxygen chamber in case Darth Vader was coming over to stay the night. However, something very strange the man tried to do was he tried to buy a very strange man himself, or rather his bones. For some reason, Michael had a fascination with the Elephant Man, a man with severe facial deformities and freak show performer from the late 1800s. Michael tried to purchase his remains. That's it. That's the point. He tried to buy him. They wouldn't let him, but he tried. That's a weird thing to buy. I've never, when I, whenever I hit the number, I don't go, hey, 1-800-Museum people, someone bring me King Tot. I want it. Number seven, Elvis Presley. Lots of similarities today. Elvis Presley, before Michael Jackson, he was probably the most famous person to ever exist. The king of rock and roll, baby, that's right. All I'll say is phone your grandma and ask her how she feels about him. She probably says she loves his music and those gyrating hips. At the time, it was pretty controversial. Boy, only if they knew what was going on today. Whew. Sorry, 50s Atomic families. Well, being that Elvis Presley was the king and the first celebrity to be idolized the way we do with modern celebrities, he became quite wealthy. Well, with all that money, he bought some weird things, including a chimp. Everyone's buying a monkey. They want a zoo. I don't know. A mansion property he named Graceland, a pink Cadillac for his mother, and strangely enough, he bought FDR's yacht. Yeah, what? That's so weird. Good president, sure, but does it really have room for a monkey and a pink Cadillac? I don't know. Number six, French royalty. This one is more about Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. It's kind of like a two-pack, kind of like a couple, but trust me, it all makes sense in the end. Uh, but it, again, and anything they bought, it was probably the king's wallet, wasn't it? Okay, so when your country is starving, demanding more rights, and in general, life really sucks, what's the next best thing you do? Buy a $12 million necklace. Yeah, right, okay, I've said that before, sure. Okay, Chad, what else? Continue to live your opulent life on the kings and people's dimes. Sure, why not? It makes sense, okay. I'm talking too much. Well, something I learned today and something that Taylor showed me is that I guess the last Queen of France was a little lonely. So what did King Louis do to fix this? Spend more time with her? Nay. Buy her a new dog? Nay, sir and madams. He had her pug from Austria imported to the country. And anyone can tell you that when something is imported, you are going to be dishing out a few more dosh. Yes, that's right. They imported her pug from Austria. Imagine how that sounds when your house is literally falling apart, you're starving and you pay the most taxes. Makes you want to put heads on pikes. That's what it makes you want to do. Imagine that, we're all poor and hungry. She's like, well, look at my dog. Here's my dog. 
they're French, they don't sound like that, but this is my dog, look at my dog, here he is. <laughs> Number five, King of Egypt. His Majesty Farouk I, by the grace of God, King of Egypt and the Sudan, that was his full title, was disposed during his nation's 1952 revolution and spent the remainder of his days in exile to Italy. In his haste to avoid getting the Mussolini treatment, he left behind a majority of his most prized possessions. When the people got a look at what he was uh, storing behind the walls of his residence, they were a bit disgusted to find an excessive number of expensive suits, rare stamps and coins, jewels, luxury vehicles and many other things that I will never afford. Now, what else would he have that would be considered strange? I'll let you take a guess. Was it A, a blam blam cache? B, piles and piles of a white substance that made the 80s fun? Or C, an unsettling amount of gardening magazines? Go ahead and let us know in the comments below. I'll give you a second. Mm -hmm. Do, 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 do. Nope, time's up. If you said secret option D, you'd be right. What was it, you ask? Well, it was a disturbing amount of adult entertainment. So much so, it wouldn't even fit underneath his mattress. Man, that's, that's a lot. That's too much. That's too much. Number four, Peter the Third. Remember the last time you played with your toys as a kid? The same. And let us know what your favorite toys were as a kid. Let's see if we have some shared favorites. I'm actually curious. That's kind of a cool thing to talk about. Well, for Peter the Third, it was little army men, or tin soldiers, I guess you'd call them. And yes, he played with them as an adult, staging mock battles. Is it the weirdest thing ever? No, it's not. But he was a king, so that's a wee bit strange. Hey, I love army men just as much as the next guy, especially those little green plastic dudes. I used to love those video games too. Very underrated in my opinion. I love that stuff. It also makes me think of that scene in Spaceballs. Enough references aside, you never really know someone until you've seen the money they've spent on their army men collection. Number three, Ibrahim the First. Fur, fur everywhere. Abram I of the Ottoman Empire was the 18th Sultan and the number one purchaser of fine furs. Personally, I've never had any fine furs. I grew up in the trailer park and Mama always said that fur was cruel anyway, so I never felt the luxury of uh, fine furs, if you will. It must be nice because Ibram loved them so much. Like, he really, really loved them. His whole wardrobe consisted of them, in fact. Plus, his walls were covered in them, and apparently even his curtains. I don't do well in heat, so I'll pass on that. I'd be sweating way too much. Too much fur. Number two, the locksmith. Who are you and how'd you get in here? I'm the locksmith and uh, I'm the locksmith. Classic Leslie Nielsen. God, I love that guy. I love those movies. I'd love to make one one day. We're starring one. Hollywood, call me. King Louis XVI, the last king of France. We're back to him again. The man spent his time and money on something rather strange. No, not all was spent on his wife and her life. And yeah, I'm kind of putting him on the list twice, but trust me, it's weird. I mean, come on. He gave the queen whatever the heck she wanted. Well, apparently he loved to spend his time and money on locksmithing. What? Yeah, that's so weird. He would spend his time trying to get into locks and understand them. He was also stated as saying that every man should have a passion. Hey, maybe put down the locks and start helping the people as a passion. There's an idea. What a great idea. Feed the people. Instead, I'm just going to work on this lock. I'm just going to go ahead and just, yeah, almost got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Number one, Christian the Seventh of Denmark. I saw this and I just, I just had to put it on here. I mean, come on. Apparently, the guy wasn't very mentally stable. I mean, who is these days? Apparently, the royal spent a lot of his time uh, waxing his carrot, polishing the flagpole, tenderizing the gabagoo, charming the snake, uh, self-firing in all cylinders, the one-handed bedroom dance. Uh, what I did all summer long in high school. You get the point, okay? You understand what I'm trying to say. Truth of the matter is, you don't get there with a little help from Vaseline or St. Ives. The man bought time so he could be this way. The man is either a legend or a crazy person. Imagine having that much money and that much time in your day that that's all you do. And at number 10 is Ludwig II. Ludwig operated as the King of Bavaria from 1845 to 1886. He was an opera fan, builder of dream palaces, spendthrift, deposed monarch, and likely the victim of a coup. So Ludwig was an enthusiastic consumer of art. So when he was appointed to the throne at just 18, he exploits his status for entertainment. He funds his hero, the composer Richard Wagner, on some of the era's most renowned operas. He also built Neuschwanstein, I can't say it properly to save my life, but it's a fairy tale palace on a hilltop. All this lavish expenditure was causing more and more debt in the empire and so higher taxes. It caused in 1886 conspirators to file a false medical document declaring Ludwig insane and unfit to rule. He may have spent an insane amount of money, but he himself wasn't. So, irregardless, that next morning, 
Ludwig and his personal physician are found floating dead in a Bavarian lake with no indication as to what had happened to him. One of Ludwig's most famous statements had been, I wish to remain an internal enigma to myself and others. Well, Goal achieved. Number nine is Henry V. Can't talk crazy without bringing up this guy. He's famous for his rinse and repeat style of having wives. As you may know, first he gets a wife, then he gets tired of her and is annoyed she can't have his male heir. So he obtains a side piece. So now you get rid of the initial wife, usually through de and then marry the side piece. Repeat. He did this numerous times. Henry also slept with just about anyone he could find, including his second wife's sister. And he may have fathered two of her kids. Ugh. And Henry is recorded to have a minimum of 12 mistresses outside his six wives, but there is potential for more. When Henry takes up wife number one's lady in waiting, Anne Boleyn, he'd actually subverted the entire religion that they were a part of in order to divorce his initial wife, Catherine, and marry this mistress, effectively establishing a new church in which he became the head and changing the course of history. The huge scandal came not so much from that, but because in 1536, Anne was accused of adultery with five men, one of her own brother, and plotting the king's assassination, which was a sensational news story at the time. Number eight is the Christian IV of Denmark. Even when he first took the throne in 1766, people were already convinced he was crazy. This brat threw food at dinner guests and picked fights, but rich people can be real jerks, so it wasn't until at some point when Christian discovered a newfound interest in is that he became an official write-off. This guy became so obsessed with the flicking of the wrist that it interrupted his royal duties. In fact, his court confronted him with the concern that it was affecting his health and could potentially make him infertile or insane. In an 18th century version of stop that or you'll go blind. Thankfully, he didn't do it in front of visiting dignitaries at first. Instead, he just did other weird stuff like leapfrog to them or slap them without warning or push them over. He'd randomly yelp or holler in the middle of a conversation. Eventually, the court's concern grew true and Christian was so nuts that his personal physician managed to talk him into handing over the control of executive decision making to himself, also while banging Christian's wife in the background. Christian wanted to keep that appendage to himself, so I guess somebody else had to do the job for him. Or both of them, I guess. Number seven is a mouthful, Nibashid Nazar II. One of the greatest Babylonian kings who I'll be calling Neb for my own sake, won battles against Egypt and Assyrians in his quest to make Babylonia the most powerful city state. He gained control of trade and messed Mesopotamia from Syrian and Palestinians. He was powerful and tactical, and for seven years, he wandered open fields convinced he was an ox. This tale of insanity is documented in the Bible. According to Daniel 4.25, Neb had a disturbing dream in which his interpreter told him it meant, you will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched in the dew of the heavens. This prophecy fulfilled itself 12 months later when Neb fled from civilization suddenly. It's quoted he began eating grass like an ox. He became wet from dew. His hair grew long like feathers of an eagle, and his nails grew long like claws of a bird. Then at the end of that time, which was seven years as mentioned, he says, I am Neb, but ne Neb, well, I'm Neb. I looked up toward the heaven, and I was right in my mind again. Ironically, there's actually a medical term for this. Boanthropy is a psychological disorder where a sufferer believes they are a cow or ox. So I guess this happened enough times for a term. Number six is a wacky dude, Ibrahim of the Ottoman Empire. Ibrahim's scandals are more ridiculous ridiculous than empire crumbling. He was known for a deep passionate love of plus size women. Not in a I like them thick kind of way, but Ibrahim's juices started flowing for obese women. So this sultan had his agents track down the largest woman in the entire Ottoman Empire, said to have weighed about 280 to 300 pounds. The sultan was so delighted by her, he gave her a high government salary and the title of governor of Damascus. Also the cute nickname Seke Pere, which translated means a piece of sugar. Ibrahim wasn't even fully right in his mind, before taking the throne. In the Ottoman Empire, it was normal for sultans to slaughter their entire family to ensure there are no corruption or attempts for the throne. Ibrahim's older brother actually let him live because he seemed so mentally ill, even as a prepubescent, to ever even be a threat to the throne. Which, by the way, Ibrahim only ever got because his brother died prematurely without heirs. So after drowning 280 concubines for having another man touch them and feeding tons of gold coins to fish in his palace pool and some other weird stuff, his reign was cut short when a coup led by the Ottomans highest religious leader as well as a six
old son had him strangled. Number five is the Zengde Emperor of China. He is remembered as a notorious leader of the Ming Dynasty for both his wild behavior and his cruelty. His biggest scandal surrounded the poor decision to leave senior Anuk Liu Jin in charge of the state's affairs. This causes unseemly taxes and poverty and unnecessary acts of aggression, things the general public, you know, tend to hate. The two finally fell out after two years, and Liu was sentenced to slow slicing, a particularly graphic, drawn out, torturous death I don't recommend you look into without a strong stomach. Oh, and on top of that, he would waste the resources of his kingdom to play pretend. He would take the faux role of a general and went on raiding parties that were all dressed in silk. He even invented an imaginary best friend slash alter ego named Zhu Shu. To the exasperation of the Chinese government, he actually made them address this imaginary friend or watched as he ordered it on pointless raiding missions. Ironically, it's rumored sometimes he'd even put on a wig to represent his own alter ego and have the courts address him as Zhu Shu. Eventually, Zheng Dei, the emperor, unexpectedly dies at the age of 29, shortly after he drunkenly fell off of a boat and contracted some fatal disease in the Yellow River. Number four, we can't talk scandal without Caligula. The emperor of Rome, he was born in 12 AD and lived to 41 AD. Caligula spent his time on the throne building lavish projects, exercising his sadism and brutality, and exhibiting eccentric behavior at any chance. Also cheating. So much cheating on his wife. Well, wives. Four wives. Caligula sucked at settling down, and his proclivity for both genders apparently made it no easier. He was known to seduce senators' wives right in front of them, bring home working girls, and engage in affairs with theater acts, specifically a dude named Menster. He also happened to love banging his sister. These did not win him public favor. Caligula is said to have banned the mention of goats in his presence due to his hairy appearance, and also practiced facial contortions to make himself be terrifying to his subjects. He was obsessed with his horse, building an entire castle, and attempting to appoint the steed to the high office of consul. And he once even had his army construct a two mile floating bridge just so it could gallop along it. After five years of this, his own army kills him. His unforgivable mistake was to jeopardize Rome's military reputation by declaring a sort of surreal war on the sea, ordering his soldiers to wade in, slash at the waves with their swords and spears, and carry chests full of seashells away as spoils of a victory over the god Neptune. Number three is Emperor Jiajing of China. He's actually the cousin of the previously mentioned Zengde Emperor, a family that scandals together stays together. And man, did this guy have some ideas. From dabbling in Taoism, he became obsessed with the legendary elixir of immortality and believed that collecting the menstrual blood of female virgins and using it to make a substance called red lead would give him powers that would enable him to live forever. Over 20 of these poor concubines were held directly for this purpose, as well as for his exploitations. They were only fed mulberry leaves and rainwater to keep them pure and faced harsh living situations. In 1542, 16 of these concubines emotionally broke and planned a coup. They were seconds from success had one of the conspirators not panicked and backed out, running to snitch to the empress. The emperor was unconscious for over 24 hours, and so the empress decided to deal out the punishments on her own and gave the 16 girls the terrible death sentence of slow slicing. Also, their family members beheaded and others taken into forced servitude. One of the concubines she'd sentenced, however, was the emperor's favorite. So when a fire broke out a couple of years later in their temple, he actually let his wife perish in order she not be saved. Apparently, she'd always been too old for his perverted taste. The emperor died in 1567 at the age of 59. It's been widely speculated he succumbed to the toxic mercury contained in the elixirs of immortality that he had been ingesting over his lifetime. Number two is Charles III. He ruled from the time he was 12 in 1380 to his death in 1422, whilst under the 100 year war of England was at its peak. Naturally, this is a horrible time to have someone dubbed Charles the Mad on the throne. In 1392, he shows his first red flags of instability when he suddenly turns on his own knights during a manhunt and starts attacking his own advisor. It took several knights to subdue him and carry him back to the castle. It's all downhill from there. While they had assumed it was stress that caused that outburst, in the following years, it would prove otherwise. He began to forget people's names and roles, including his own. He would forget where he was, even like he was king. Maybe this was because he spent so much time running around the castle on all fours, pretending to be a wolf and howling at people. By the time Charles was convinced he was made of glass and banned people from touching him lest he break, well, his family had written him off. But now they were multiple sides vying for that throne. So during the Hundred Year War, civil war breaks out in the French monarchy between Charles's brother and cousin. This allowed England and other countries an 
immense upper hand in invasions, and so by the time Charles dies, much of France was occupied by foreign powers. And number one is Emperor Rudolf II. This guy was a known disaster. He was elected as the Holy Roman Empire in 1576 when he was already experiencing deep depression and mania. He also immediately tore up the religious settlement that for the past 20 years had kept Germany's Catholics and Protestants away from each other. Ending all peace, he embarked on a crusade to eradicate Protestantism from Germany's towns and villages, restarting an unnecessary war that had already been finished. Protestants' response was fast and strong, a self-defense league, alongside Hungarians rising in revolt and Turkish also taking an offensive. <sighs> Rudolf ran his up to Prague Castle and hid, refusing to speak to anyone. This scandal has the Habsburgs replace Rudolf with his brother Matthias, who undoes all the damage by restoring religious peace to Germany and signing treaties with the Turkish and Hungarians. Rudolf has a tantrum over this and starts the Turkish war again. So the Bohemians appeal to Matthias again for help, and in 1611, Rudolf was forced to hand power over to his brother once and for all. He died a year later, only after laying the foundation for the disastrous 30 years of war that would tear Europe apart within six Six years of his death. Uh, kicking off the list at number 10, must love licorice. Okay, we'll start off a little tame. Napoleon Bonaparte, the famous French emperor, the famous military leader from the 1800s. Napoleon Bonaparte was responsible for conquering a large part of Europe. Bet you didn't know he was obsessed with licorice though. Way too much. He would eat this all day, every day. Ugh, it feels gross. Look, as somebody who can't stand licorice, I already feel bad for Josephine. Licorice breath at any time of the day coming your way? No, no thank you. I'll hard pass. Napoleon carried licorice around with him at all times. This guy ate so much of it, his teeth became stained. They turned black. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it's black licorice too. Not the strawberry pull and peels, those are great. I'm talking about 1800s black licorice. It would come in lozenges. If somebody offered me a lozenge and it was black licorice, I'd call the police. Smack it out of their hands. Number nine, George IV. When it was time for King George III to pass on the crown, of course, next in line, heir to the throne, is his eldest son, also named George. What if you became king in 1820? Would you be noble? Would you do monologues in the sunset as you enriched your homeland? Kings like to do that a lot with their off by the hair still. Or would you do what King George IV did and make horrible financial decisions every single day? The guy would just party all day as well. He would gamble every day, he would buy expensive stuff that he did not need, and on top of that, he would never do any of his royal duties. Guy wouldn't do his job. His father had to step in, classic. He figured the only way to settle all these new debts set in motion by George IV, in order to clear those up, George now has to marry his cousin, Caroline of Brunswick. The arranged marriage happened April 8th, 1795, and what was supposed to be a happy day for all was a nightmare for all included. They hated each other as soon as they met. I mean, obviously, he was a fool. George got heavily intoxicated for the wedding. He was just hammered the entire time. And then nine months later, almost to the day, they had a child. And then right after that happened, they went their separate ways. So yeah, horribly unhealthy relationship. Once George became king in 1820, he then tried to divorce her. Like, what a fool, just let it go. Let it all go, let her go. Number eight, Filippo Maria Visconti. The Duke of Milan during the 14th century was at first Gian Maria Visconti, but after he was taken out, his brother, Filippo Maria Visconti, had to step up to the bat. As a ruler, Filippo was better. His brother had been cruel previously, hence the untimely departure. So this was a good move at first, so we thought. Now Filippo had to take over come 1412. Filippo was better than his brother on paper. He helped reorganize government finances. He got the silk industry up and running, which we love that. He ended up passing away of natural causes down the road, which is, you know, nothing like his brother. But while he was in power, he never showed his face to anybody, not even people close to him. He hid in his palace most of the time, and it was odd because he thought that he was ugly. That's why he hid his face. Kind of sad, right? Filippo hid his face, and maybe you feel bad for him now, right? Just a little bit. He died of natural causes, and he was alone all that time. Yeah, don't feel bad for him. This guy was horrible. He was jealous of his wife, Beatrice Lascaris de Tenda, because she was twice his age, twice as smart, and twice as powerful. So, Filippo had her taken out in a courtyard publicly September 13th, 1418. Yeah, he accused her of adultery just cause, cause he could and he had some suspicions in his dark room by himself hiding his face. History is ugly and sometimes it's literally ugly as well. Number seven, George I. King George I, couple of Georges on this list, okay? Long before his British ruling days, George was in Germany. He was actually the elector there, and he'd been married before around 1682. Originally, he married Sophia Dorothea of Seal, 
But the entire time they were married, it was horrible. George would straight up bring other women home because he just felt like he could. Like he, he literally argued that he could given his role. He's like, oh, I could have these women and we could do all this in front of you. Of course, I'm this person of this. Like, no, you're a fool. You're a jerk, really. He would have numerous mistresses and he would purposely flaunt them. So Sophia thought, okay, if you can have numerous side hustles going on, I'll move on myself. So she began seeing a Swedish count. <laughs> okay. She began seeing Philip Christoph von Konigsmark. Now when George inevitably found out, he was violent at this point. He was upset, he divorced Sophia and then imprisoned her. Yeah, when he became king of Britain later on in 1714, she didn't come with him. Yeah, it's not just horrible with Sophia either. The Duke had also been taken out, sadly. His love for Sophia ended up getting him killed. What a mess, all these Georges are so messy, the worst. If your name's George, don't be a mess. Just be nice. Hit that thumbs up if you're a George. Change the game. Change the stats up. Number six, heir to the throne. Okay, I kicked out this list roasting Napoleon and his licorice choices, but of course, he's done much worse things than have bad breath and stained teeth. Napoleon's marriage to Josephine was first fueled by love and friendship, but things quickly changed. Marie Josephine Rose Tasher de la Pagerie was born in 1763. She had two children with her first husband, but that marriage was also not a happy time. They separated and Josephine met Napoleon in 1795. Napoleon at this point was married at the time and they had an affair and they were deeply in love, like actually in love. And Napoleon proposed to Josephine in 1796 and they married later that year. Two days after their wedding, Napoleon led the French army in Italy and while he was gone, both of them ended up having affairs. So many affairs in this. Like, does love even exist? What the hell? 1804, Napoleon crowned himself and then crowned Josephine, proclaiming her empress. A few years passed, and after finding out Josephine couldn't bear any more children, Napoleon made a list of possible and eligible princesses. Just a list, and just left it out. Like, how, how awful is that? In November 1809, Josephine agreed to the divorce, and come 1821, Napoleon Bonaparte's final word on his deathbed was, Josephine. Yeah, a little darker than a licorice, just a tad. Number five, King Henry VIII. The second wife of King Henry VIII. She was found guilty of treason, and she had been charged with having full relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Bolin. She had also apparently, apparently, had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close, I mean, they were really close. He was the groom of the stool. So they were close, and on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Hmm, I wonder why. This list will explain a few reasons. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish. Anne wasn't present when these events even went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I. So there's no way she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533, your honor. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill, May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her own little neck before being taken out with the sword herself. Yeah, all dark. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. Somebody had to get an old elm chest from the Tower Armory. How horrible is that? Number four, a bit better. Another one of King Henry VIII's wives, Anne of Cleves. Where do we even begin here? This one is, honestly, this one's pretty sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic, in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, King Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister and then come back and compare them. This is like the birth of Tinder. I'm not even joking, this is how he did it. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. Yeah, compared her to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site, write that in. I praiseth thou beauty, madam, to a silver dollar. A silver sea sand dollar shining in the moon. What, I don't know, just click it. Click send and see what happens. Then a treaty was signed, a few weeks later Anne arrived to England and Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like the portrait, apparently. How horrible is that? Ah, you look nothing like this Victorian painting. How dare you? It's 6 a.m. and you've been riding a horse for four weeks and you don't look like this Victorian painting? Shame. He tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. And on January 6, 1540, their marriage was official. You can't unswipe this marriage, rich boy. Anne later accepted the divorce, gladly, and then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Number three, Christian VII. Christian, there's an ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. The prince that couldn't 
keep his hands out of his pants. I don't know how else to say it. Here we go. Christian VII of Denmark. He was, he was a young lad. He was spoiled. He was a little comfortable with his body, maybe too comfortable. And he would often just have his hands in his pants hanging out. He was like one of those, you know, rich king. He was kind of like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. He would just have his, just sit back and like suck on candy and stuff and just, you know, fool around. I don't know, it was gross. Middle of dinner, this guy would pass around food to his family with those gross hands. He would alternate hands and pants to handing out food. What a little twerp. Now it's unknown, but historians believe maybe, just maybe, he was a tad mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks. Go wash your hands. Twice. Number two, King Henry VIII, again. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII again, again. He's pretty bad, not gonna lie. Henry VIII was King of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times, as we've heard by now, and all of them have went south. When Henry married Catherine, he was 49. She was a few years younger. She was actually a lot younger, classic 1500s, way too young. And when they got married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had received a nasty jousting wound, so now he was gravely overweight. He didn't do anything. He just laid around all day and complained. So Catherine, of course, just wanted some, you know, shred of a life and being again quite young, too young, she decided to look for love. Well, God forbid, God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s because then the young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. And finally, coming in at number one, Henry II. The relationship between Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine is pretty memorable. It's memorable in all the wrong ways, of course. When they first met, things were good, dare I say, with both of them. They were both young and he was gonna be king. He was young, king, guy, young man who's gonna be king. And Eleanor, I mean, she was married, but once she got an annulment, their love was good. You know, their love was good and young and ready to be young king stuff. After the annulment in 1152, Henry and Eleanor tied the knot officially a couple weeks after. Love moves quickly, apparently. Henry started having affairs, because of course he did. At this point in his list, we're not gasping at affairs, sadly. But come 1173, Eleanor had convinced their sons to go against father. <sighs> yeah, Henry didn't take this well, and he had Eleanor locked up for 16 years. He had died, so after that point, she had resumed the royal roles, because at this point, those two boys had grown up and inherited the throne, Richard and John. But being locked up for that long, what a nightmare that relationship was entirely. I figured we'd end on a kind of tame one, one where she kind of came back and it was good. Kind of good, dare I say? I don't know. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have King Henry VIII. We'll start off this list with some 1500s dating drama. I love it. The fourth wife of Henry VIII, Anne of Cleves, was married to King Henry for six months. It was seen as quite strategic, actually. See, Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's duke, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein, famous painter, travel all the way to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like ancient tinder. It's wild. This man compared portraits for a few days and then finally chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. He even compared her to a silver moon. I've never heard Taylor compare me to the silver moon, so it seems like he's got to step his game up. So eventually a treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because when she arrived, she apparently looked nothing like the portrait. How horrible is that? It's 6 a.m., you just met your new husband after traveling upriver by barge, and the dude has the audacity to say you don't resemble a Victorian painting. Awesome. He even tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. Imagine still having to follow through. On January 6th, 1540, their marriage was official. But soon after, Anne gladly accepted the divorce, then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Historians believe that it was cancer. In our number nine spot today, we have King James. Before I dive into this one, guys, don't forget to hit that thumbs up if you're enjoying the video. It does really help us out. Not to be confused with LeBron James, this is a different king. In an official 16th century medical book, the actual medical advice at one point was to not bathe. Quote, use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body, and maketh the venomous air to enter, and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? Why is every shred of medical knowledge from the past always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century, a doctor would be like, ah yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick, you'll be well on your way. 
Like, bro, I have pneumonia. Please help me. They thought that taking a bath would make you sick, so King James IV apparently just never took a bath. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass on lice to others just by being in the same room as them. Even if he was in a room hours prior, but he would give you lice. Doesn't help that the guy had long hair. Guy's got Steven Tyler hair. It's like a lice lunchroom in here. Lice would emit off of this man. Margaret Tudor was married to King James IV. That must have sucked. So itchy. In our number eight spot today, we have King George V. When was the last time you saw a stamp? I haven't seen a stamp in months, but King George V? But he loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much. It was taking many hours out of his days, even when it shouldn't have been a priority at all. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everybody is trying to stay alive. George is just licking stamps in the library adding him to collections. Like all collections, the king started at an early age, but in the end of his days, George had albums and albums and albums, so many stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. That's so many stamps. In 1905, George set an all-time stamp record. It was the most money ever spent on a stamp. The man dropped like 220,000 on one stamp. That's some Logan Paul shit. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps. Or rather, the King of Philady. That's the official term for collecting stamps. Some stamp jargon for ya. There you go. Welcome to Bumblebee. We're learning. Smash that thumbs up. In our number seven spot today, we have King Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552, he was known as a collector. Some princes collect stamps, others collect zoo animals. A little more badass, if you ask me. His castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans, so good luck getting a full eight hours of sleep. He also collected human artifacts. So, yeah, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Imagine having company, don't step in lion crap, and also don't mind the jars of eyes. Cheers. King Rudolph II, he's quite important in history. He supported the scientific revolution quite a bit. He also poured tons of money into astrology, so he was into cool stuff too, besides the kidneys and kangaroo collections. In our number six spot today, we have King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians, let's do it. King George IV was too invested in his intimate conquests. He was focused on all the wrong stuff and he was also just horrible about it. This king tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him. He would throw tantrums if a crush wasn't interested, and sometimes he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get their attention. Super creepy, because on top of the lengths he would go to just to get some time alone, he also kept some of their hair after the dirty deed was done. Yeah, he would ask everybody he slept with for a lock of their hair. Back then it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair. Just envelopes of hair. The collection was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa. This insane collection is now in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want to feel sick. In our number five spot today, we have Christian the Seventh. Christian. An ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. The young prince that couldn't keep his hands out of his pants. Let's mention him. Christian VII of Denmark, he was, as I said, a wee young lad. And, of course, a wee bit spoiled. Very comfortable with his body, though, I'll say. More often than not, he would just have his hands in his pants. Middle of dinner, passing food around to his family, alternating hands in the pants to hands on food. This should have been number one, now that I think of it. What a little sh it's unknown, but historians believe maybe he was a wee bit mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks so much. In our number four spot today, we have King Henry VIII. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII. He's pretty bad. Henry VIII was the King of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times, and they all went south. When Henry married Catherine Howard, he was 49, and Catherine was a lot younger. Classic 1500s stuff. After the two were married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had since received a nasty jousting wound to the face, was gravely overweight, and never wanted to do anything with Catherine. So Catherine, of course, just wanting some shred of a life and being, again, quite young, decided to look for love. Well, God forbid. God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s. The young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. She was accused of cheating before they even got married and in turn lost her head. 
horrible times. In our number 3 spot today we have Don Carlos. Prince of Asturias in the mid 1500s, the Spanish prince who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was a horrible person. Now, it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him physically. That sucks on one hand, but it's how you deal with it and how you deal with others that shows what type of person you are, let alone leader. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad, Philip II of Spain, so right off the hop, easy promotion. All about who you know. Don Carlos would hurt people a lot. He would hurt animals for fun as well. As a true crime enthusiast, you know that's a red flag. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how they looked. He made somebody eat a pair of boots. We're not gonna feel bad for Don Carlos on Bumblebee today. No, sir. He was set up to marry Elizabeth of Valios, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided there's absolutely no way in hell, so she married his father instead, King Philip, in 1560. In 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos, Mary, Queen of Scots, Margaret of Valios, and Anne of, of Austria. When Carlos was plotting to take out his own father, he was caught and imprisoned in solitary confinement until his death six months later. In our number two spot today, we have the personal sheet changer. I can't tell if this is the worst job to have or the best. Here we go. Royals have been sweating constantly about people trying to take them out. Taylor has mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy that stalked the queen. It's terrifying. People are terrifying. Boy Jones would go through the queen's drawers. Big ew. So historically, the royal family would try their best to anticipate an attack, be as safe as you can be. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you ever heard about this royal position? A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned them, and they also had a guy get tucked in the king's sheets. I would much rather have the latter. King Henry VIII hired somebody to make sure his bed wasn't poisoned, so you were required to make the king's bed every morning. But you also had to rub all the sheets down before bedtime. You'd have to kiss the bed sheets to make sure that they weren't poisoned. Sleep tight, all safe here. Don't mind the bad breath on all of your pillows. You're safe though. All right, time to clock out for the day. Clothes as well, that was touched. Maybe not kissed, but for sure touched. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed, no way I'd rather get poisoned. Take my jeans off. In our number one spot today, we have King Louis the 14th. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the royal household. Back in the olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies, specifically King Louis the 14th. Guy loved enemas. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier by using almond milk. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out the almond milk. Like, not again, Louis, come on. I just ate, man. No. Kicking off the list at number 10, a goodnight kiss. We'll start off funny, okay? History can be funny sometimes, even when it's not meant to be, and it's meant to be completely serious, I can't help but read this information and laugh. Royals were sweating constantly about people trying to take them out, of course. I mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy stalked the queen over and over for years. Historically, these royals have been on the lookout for enemies, and the way that they prevent these attacks, yeah, sometimes it can be a little funny. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you heard about this weird position in the castle? What an odd job this is. A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned their ale, which is, you know, a pretty lousy job there. Either having a good day or a bad day, no in between. But they also had a guy kiss the king's sheets every day, just, they just kissed the entire bed. The king size, may I remind you, massive bed. King Henry VIII, this guy hired somebody to literally just go in, get snuggled up, and just make sure the king's bed wasn't poisoned. There's nothing on it that's gonna make the skin go all ouchy. But he would just get in his bed and just Let's go to sleep for a bit. You are required to make the king's bed every morning, of course, and before he gets back in, you gotta get in and you gotta get in and kiss that bed, man. You gotta kiss that bed real good. Mwah, mwah. Let's go. Mwah. All right, time to clock out for the day. Mwah. One more for good luck. Clothes as well. That was touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure worn and touched. With It's so weird. Guy's wearing my clothes in my bed. No way. I'd rather get poisoned. 
Like, yo, take my jeans off. Who is that guy? Get back here. It's like, imagine marrying that king, and it's like, oh, hang on, before we get snugged in, this guy has to go and kiss your sheets. She's like, ew, what? Why does my sheets smell like breath? Everything smells like breath. Number nine, enemas. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the household. Yeah, this, yeah. Back in the olden days, ye olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Well, rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies, specifically King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. Just big old fan of enemas. It's believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Thousands. It's a lot of, a lot of decimals. Decimals for enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. Like, guy, that's like 112 too much, I'd say. I don't know. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier, by using um, almond milk for the enemas. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out almond milk and you're like, oh, no, not again. Come on, Louis, please, I just ate. Number eight, no bathing in this house. Bathing in the olden days wasn't fully understood, if that makes any sense. Like in a medical book, in an official 16th century medical book, the medical advice was use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? What? What does it even mean? Why is every shred of medical knowledge always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century, a doctor would just be like, ah yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick and you'll be on your way. Like what? Do you have any halls? Help me. Help me, dude. No, I'm just mad. I just like, bro, I have pneumonia. I need, I need medicine. So of course they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. Of course. So King James IV, apparently this guy never took a bath in his life. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass lice to others just by being in the same room that he was earlier. So not at the same time, he would come in, do his king stuff, leave, and the lice would be like, Pew! and they would just wait in that room and get on someone else. That's so gross, that's horrible. Lice would emit off this man. Like the, he's like the stinky kid from Charlie Brown with the stinky cloud. That's just like lice around this guy. <laughs> Margaret Tudor was married to King James. Yeah, must have loved the no bathing thing, eh? Oh, oh boy. Number seven, Queen Caroline. Queen Caroline. Ba, ba, ba. She went out in a horrible way. We can't sing about her. History remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she went out. It was bad. It was actually written down in an epigram attributed to the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Again, it rhymes. Why do all the, why is everything rhyming? This is so awful. Who can be like, yeah, yeah, write that down. That's good. That's good. Wait, wait. It does rhyme. That's good. That yeah, checks out. Rest in peace. My gosh, her husband, he was certainly no help at all. Caroline was previously married to George IV, and this guy locked her out of Westminster on Coronation Day. So yeah, she went out in a horrible way, but let's not forget the marriage that came beforehand. That wasn't pleasant either. Nothing in this guy or this marriage was pleasant. Number six, Henry VIII. Of course he's back. He had six wives and it was pretty much entirely bad for all of them, yeah. It was the late 1400s. Henry took the throne in 1509. This guy was only 17 years old when all this madness began to unfold. Only days after the execution of Anne, who I mentioned on part one of this list, so days after he married his third wife, Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour's mothers were first cousins, so they were close, and during all of this, they, of course, went head to head more than once. Jane died shortly after giving birth to Edward VI on October 12th, 1537. I can't mention King Henry's wives and leave a couple out. This is just a history channel. We have to mention all of them, okay? Number five, George V. Turned out this guy loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much though, I'd say. It was almost distracting. It was taking up many hours of his day. Like, you know, focus on other things. Like say maybe, I don't know, the war. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everyone's trying to stay alive. George is just in the background like. Like all collections, they started at an early age. It's now at a point where it's just, you know, past impressive and borderline strange. Especially if you're a royal, like you're really going hard with this. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 
albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. That's 20,000 pages full of stamps. That's a lot, way too many stamps. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather the King of Philately. That's the official term for collecting stamps. We're historians here, we have to make it official. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record. Ho ho, the most money ever spent on a stamp. This guy dropped like 220,000 on one single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about the fool who had spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp. And he was proud, he was like, oh that fool? It was I. Number four. Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. Yeah, some princes collected stamps, others collect zoo animals. We're all different. Yeah, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and not bears, but orangutans. So good luck getting your eight hours. He also collected human artifacts, like body parts after they've been, you know, so that's, watch your step, I guess. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Watch out for the lion's tail. Careful, what a mess. He's quite important in history though, I guess. He supported the scientific revolution and he also poured tons of money into astrology, so next time you read your horoscope, remember it's Bones in the Jar Benny that's responsible for that one. And also, in case you're wondering, yeah, he didn't pay attention to any of his wives or anything like that. He was just, no, nope, jars for me, jars and animals, I'm all set. Number three, Don Carlos. Spanish crown prince, the guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Let's talk about him. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was, yeah, I want to say worse things, but he was just a really bad person. YouTube, he was just a bad guy. Now, it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter than the other. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him with these disabilities growing up and people often feel bad for him a little. To that I say, don't. Nah, don't do it. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad. Dude was fine. Philip II of Spain? Yeah, he would hurt a lot of people. He would hurt animals and people just for fun. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how the pair of boots looked. He made somebody eat boots. We're not gonna feel bad for him on Bumblebee today. That's not what we're gonna do. He was also set up to marry Queen Elizabeth of Valois, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours, she was like, no, that's not gonna happen, no way. So she married his father instead. That's what happens, that's what happens when you're in 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos. Mary, Queen of Scots, was one of them. Margaret of Valois, we know what happened with her, and Anna of Austria. But his mental conditions grew worse and it went south. Shocker. Number two, Heart of Glass. King Charles VI, once nicknamed the Beloved and then quickly nicknamed the Mad. What happened? After he became King of France in 1380, he would have these episodes, let's call them. He would believe he was made of glass and he didn't want anybody to touch him. He had this glass delusion, which was surprisingly not uncommon, believe it or not, for this time period. Believing you were made out of glass in some way, shape, or form, be it in your head, butt, shoulders, or back, really spiked around the mid 1400s. And Charles VI, AKA Charles the Mad, he wouldn't let anybody, not even his wife, near him at all. I'm not making fun of somebody for having a fear like that. I mean, most likely historians believe he was schizophrenic, so obviously I'm not ripping on that. But Alexandria of Bavaria, another royal who had this glass delusion, she too believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass, so she had to enter rooms sideways to avoid it chattering. I don't know what's going on with this glass delusion, but I'm glad it went away, I don't know. And finally, number one, King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians. So that should already tell you a good amount of this guy. George was another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his, you know, intimate side quests, if you know what I'm saying here, like all these other kings we've talked about. He was a bit busy being a stupid fool. This man was trying literally everything to get a woman to sleep with him. Although he was the king and he was already set up, he was like, nope, I'm gonna go and keep trying with strangers and random. And he would throw a tantrum if they said no, or he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get the girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? One of those kind of monsters. He would also keep uh, trophies, lack of a better term, of all these conquests afterwards. He would ask each people that he slept with for a little piece of hair and then he would keep them, he would like store them. Back then it was kind of common, I guess, for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, weirdly enough, because you don't have phone numbers or like any sort of way to remember someone, photos, I don't know. So you kept their hair. But after the king died, his brother found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. So yeah, I'll leave you on that note. I think there's a hair in my mouth, that's kind of gross. Number 10, the young czar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, 
That's hard too, even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9. Nero Steam We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives, wait, that's we gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that theatrics are important. Remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that for shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry. No, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right. 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. Yeah. Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. Well, all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can, like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss, so much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it's said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather... Uh, well, mistreatment of women. YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number five, Pedro of Castile. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you're gonna let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? 
Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. I gotta get my gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things. Someone to go through life with. Companionship. Love. And if you're lucky, someone is a good cook or a baker. I love me some baked goods. Mm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for example, who loved loving his wife so much that he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just, God, that doesn't seem right, you know? That just, let her, you know, let her, let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just, ah, Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate, like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own. Mm. And had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two. Pope John the 12th. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, th this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican, and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope is pretty sick, not gonna lie. However, Pope John the 12th was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's the king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple bad things he said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he is telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know. 